We are agreed. Now we turn now to topical questions, and we start with question number one from John Finney. Uh, thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to reports that widespread disruption to Calmac services is anticipated until the end of May. Minister Hamza Youssef. <laughs> uh, Calmac is, of course, trying its best to mitigate the impact on the network over the period to the end of May. It's redeploying vessels within the fleet to ensure that lifeline connections are maintained to the communities it serves in the Clyde and Hebrides network. The MV Klansman was expected out of dry dock on the 11th of March. However, damage to the propulsion system and rudder has led to delay with essential repairs required. Uh, safety must, of course, be my and indeed Calmac's top priority with the delivery of services. However, I also fully understand the frustration of communities uh, on, on the Clyde and Hebrides network, which rely on their ferry services. The frequency of service for some routes may, however, uh, be reduced uh, from normal during the period uh, of disruption and have been uh, amended to suit. Uh, CalMAC have also secured an extension from the MCA, the Maritime and Coast Guard Agency, for the MV Hebrides passenger certificate, thereby avoiding two major vessels being out of the fleet at the same time. Um, the, the, the MV Loch Brusda will commence service on the Malague Armadale route later uh, today as well. Finally, I uh, will continue to closely monitor the situation and uh, even today have spoken to the Chair and indeed the, the Interim Director uh, of CalMAC. Officer, I thank the Minister for that response. Minister, I obtained figures from CalMAC this week showing that uh, there were 3,852 cancellations in the last five years caused as a result of mechanical failures. The average age on the Clyde and Hebrides, Hebrides ferry service routes is 23 years, and of course older vessels need longer periods of repair and dry dock. A lack of coordination between Caledonian Maritime Assets Limited, who own and maintain the vessels, and CalMac um, clearly is a factor. Minister, do you believe, given the huge scale of disruption, the there's this document here, the Vessels Replacement and Deployment Plan, developed by CMAL and CalMAC in 2016 and published in January is fit for purpose. Minister Hamza Youssef. Uh, yes, I mean, the point of the Vessels de Plan, uh, of course, uh, is that we have a roadmap for the coming years in order to, uh, that, to, to address the ageing fleet uh, uh, issue that he, he quite rightly mentions. Uh, of course, what we have seen is a huge growth uh, in terms of island tourism, and that, of course, has been uh, held by RET and the introduction of RET. To extent we've seen 37% vehicle growth over the last uh, five years. So uh, where there are helpful suggestions in around uh, our vessel uh, redeployment plan, then, of course, I will uh, happily sit down with the member uh, and take his suggestions. But this government is investing in vessels, uh, the latest of which, of course, he knows, uh, are in being built on the Clyde, where we've brought commercial shipbuilding uh, back onto the Clyde. Uh, the sooner, of course, uh, they are completed two time and two schedule, uh, of course, uh, the better. What we can do in terms of a short-term solution to some of the, uh, the issues that are being faced in the Clyde and Hebrides network, I've asked CalMAC to look at what additional sailings can be put on uh, in order to mitigate some of the disruption that we've seen. John Finney. Said, officer, I, I thank you for these comments, uh, Minister. You'll understand frustrations remain nonetheless. The Scottish Government's ferry plan for 2013-2023 recommended replacement of the majority of the CalMAC fleet. However, CMAL are entirely responsible for design and procurement. Do you, Minister, but see a role for, public, for the public sector operator and trade unions earlier in the procurement process? And finally, what overall assessment has the Government made of this disruption to our island communities, please? Uh, I certainly wouldn't be adverse to that at all, that suggestion uh, around uh, being involved in the procurement uh, at an earlier stage. And I think it's a good one, so let me go back and, and, and reflect on how we do that. I just go back to my central point that we are investing, we've invested in, uh, I think, around about eight uh, vessels in our time since 2007. We've got two that are being built, as, a, as I say, at Ferguson's. Uh, and then we've also committed, of course, that the next vessel will serve the, the Isla route, for which I have helpfully on my left, of course, the, the, the MSP uh, who represents uh, that uh, island. Uh, so we are continuing to invest. We will continue to invest. But his point is not lost to me that there is frustration when there is a, 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 an issue, a breakdown on the network that can have quite catastrophic uh, results. So our and CalMAC's uh, immediate priority has to be uh, to ensure that lifeline services can continue. I should say CalMAC are also very aware of particular pinch points, uh, and they want to ensure that when it comes to, for example, the Whiskey Festival in Isla, the, the World War I commemorations that are taking place, that there are either additional sailings being put on 
or in some respects additional capacity wherever possible. So I think the points that the member may, raises are, are ones that I will reflect on. Kate Forbes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Malig to Armadale crossing has been hit particularly hard by the domino effect of Calmac moving vessels around the network. And it's a reminder of the difficult season of uh, summer 2016. It's costing local businesses and residents. I'm sure the Minister will agree this is concerning. Will he raise this with Calmac and urge them to find an immediate solution for Sky and Harbour residents? Minister. Well, yes, I entirely agree that uh, th th there's an issue there of, of, of frustration. I've met with the uh, the, the various stakeholders in the Lake Armadale on a number of occasions, including, of course, with the MSP and the local MP, uh, to discuss this. And I have to say, in 2017, we're in a much better situation than we were in 2016, and it feels, unfortunately, uh, that we've gone somewhat backwards, and that's not an acceptable situation uh, at all to be in. But I hope she's reassured by uh, the news I gave in my opening uh, remark uh, and, and answer, which was that the Loch Brewster uh, will commence service on the Lake Armadale today, which will help, of course. Uh, but we have to look at the Lake Armadale at the longer-term solution uh, and again, uh, looking at what vessels uh, we build in the future will undoubtedly be part of that. Donald Cameron. Thank you. The Minister will be well aware of the current disruption, be it on Oban to Cull and Tyree service, the Malague to Loch Boisdale route, and the Ardrossan to Campbelltown summer service. Can the Minister explain why the Government have let this situation get completely out of hand, not least since islands and communities are now being pitted against each other in a competition for ferries? Minister. I don't agree with the premise of his question. I should say the services that he mentions have been raised with me uh, by, by Mike Russell on a number of uh, occasions and we're working closely with constituency MSPs and indeed MPs and I was recently on uh, both Isla and, and, and Jura taking part in a transport summit uh, on some of these issues as well as those that affect uh, a number of our other islands on the Clyde and Hebrides network. And it's not about, you know, it takes a very, I should say, a very simplistic but also I think frankly a very immature response to, to what is a very serious and a complex issue. Uh, we have uh, a growth and a huge growth as I've already explained, 37% in terms of vehicle traffic over the last five years, which is, which is great because we're seeing more people traveling uh, to our islands. Uh, we then have to invest in ferries, which we have built eight, another two uh, that we're building at Ferguson's. So we can't magic them up overnight, but the solutions we can do is look out on the open market to see where we can charter uh, additional tonnage, and we should do that, and we are doing that. That equally comes, uh, of course, at a cost and they have to fit into the ports and the harbours. And then, of course, we can also look at additional sailings, which we are actively in CalMac and actively doing. So this idea that one island is getting pitted against the other, I think, is language that I would uh, want, counsel the member to perhaps avoid uh, in the future, because that is not what is happening here. Uh, what we are trying to do is make sure that lifeline services in the face of disruption can be preserved. Uh, and I hope, uh, as I say, that we can find some solutions uh, to that. David Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. The Minister will be well aware of my high regard for CalMac, but the CalMac Community Board have recently expressed concern about disruption caused by ferry failures in the fleet. As we've heard from John Finney, would the Minister share my assessment that the age of vessels is a key concern? Eight are more than 30 years old and half are more than 25 years old. Could the Minister discuss with CalMac and CMAL the resilience of the fleet and the related issue of maintenance and dry docking? Minister. Yes, and can I thank Dave Stewart for uh, the tone of his question as well, which again, in, in stark contrast to the one we just heard that previously, because he understands the complexity of the issue. So yes, the ageing vessel fleet uh, is an issue uh, for us. We have invested uh, in, in vessels more than, than, than I should say even, even previous administrations. So we've invested in vessels and will continue to invest in vessels. But he's absolutely right. I think the point he makes about dry docking uh, it just demonstrates again his understanding of the issue which I appreciate which is that as the as the age of the vessel uh, increases of course it may well have to spend longer uh, being maintained in dry dock and therefore we have to factor and CalMac has to factor that, 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 that in uh, in order to, to minimize disruption so uh, that is a conversation CalMac are having as well as investing uh, in, in, in additional tonnage uh, additional uh, vessels and, and, and additional sailings I should say but also actively looking at how we can spend money to, re to, to, to refit, to refurbish, or even re-engineer vessels to get uh, to sweat out the asset for even longer as well. So all of these are, are part of the mix of solution, but none of them, uh, of course, uh, come without a price tag. Uh, and, and of course, uh, many of them uh, will, are not overnight solutions either. And question number two, Anas Sarwar. officer, to ask the Scottish Government what its response is to reports that the number of doctors who are seeking early retirement has doubled in the last eight years. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robertson. Under this government, NHS staffing and doctor numbers have increased to a record high level. 
In fact, in the last eight years, the number of doctors working in our NHS has increased by over 1,800. That's an increase of over 17%. While the recently shared figures on early retirement are for NHS staff in general rather than doctors specifically, we know that there are a number of factors that can lead to someone choosing early retirement. For example, for GPs, we've heard previously that the UK government reducing the lifetime allowance for pensions tax relief in recent years has led a number of GPs to take early retirement. We've outlined a number of actions through part one of our health and care workforce plan to increase the number of opportunities for people to train as doctors. We've also increased um, an additional, we've also created, sorry, an additional 140 medical training places since 2017. We'll build on this when we publish part three of the plan for primary care next week, including reiterating our aim of increasing GP numbers by 800 over the next decade. Anasawa. Cabinet Secretary, every day we hear stories of NHS staff who are overworked, undervalued and under-resourced. Figures show that over the last eight years of this SNP government, the early retirements of NHS staff have doubled. And in the Cabinet Secretary's own backyard of crisis-hit NHS Tayside, it has more than trebled. That is shameful. So can I ask the Cabinet Secretary to stop the complacent responses and instead give Scotland a credible workforce plan? Can we have a credible workforce plan from a credible health secretary? Well, can I say every day our NHS delivers a fantastic service to the people of Scotland, yeah. which is why patient satisfaction rates are at a record high. Uh, I think in there somewhere, Anna Sauer asked about the workforce plan. Uh, and of course, uh, as I've said to him in the initial answer, we have already uh, published uh, parts one and two of the workforce plan. Part three, focusing on primary care, will be published uh, next week. That lays out a comprehensive plan of how we're going to grow all parts of the workforce, including the medical workforce. As I said in my initial answer, we've created an additional 140 medical training places since just last year alone. I think all of that taken together uh, is uh, uh, a good uh, news story. And of course, um, if the Workforce uh, Commission uh, that Anna Sarwar established uh, over a year ago uh, has any good ideas to bring forward when it, is, when it eventually reports, then of course we'll look forward to having some constructive input to the workforce planning debate. Anna Sarwar. The reality is that these problems are a result of years of mismanagement. And the Cabinet Secretary mentions NHS staff. She's right, we should thank our staff, but our thanks is not enough. NHS staff member after NHS staff member telling us about the pressure they face every single day. And as Peter Benny of the BMA put at the weekend, doctors are under pressure like never before. And that mismanagement was further highlighted this morning at Health Committee, where it was revealed that NHS Lothian alone need £31 million more money just to keep existing levels of service. When will the Cabinet Secretary get her head out the sand and recognise that we need meaningful action now, not the same old tired excuses? Cabinet Secretary, it's time to step up or step down. Senator Robertson. Well, every day our NHS staff deliver a fantastic service and uh, the BME, of course, what Dana Sarver failed to mention was the BMA acknowledged that we have more staff and more resources, but they also not unreasonably pointed out that demand is also increasing, which is why we are providing record funding to Scotland's NHS. NHS. We've recently announced further investment of more than £350 million in Scotland's frontline health boards, including additional investment in service reform and improvement of £175 million in order to meet that increasing demands because of an ageing population. As I said, NHS staff numbers are at a historically high level but up by over 13,000 under this government, with more doctors, nursing and midwifery staff now delivering care for the people of Scotland. We're expanding that with a further 55 undergraduate medical training places. And as I said earlier, we've created an additional 140 medical training places since last year alone. And of course, we're committed to 800 more GPs over the next 10 years. I think taken together, that is a pretty uh, good package of workforce planning. Sandra White. 
<clears throat> Thank you very much, President Officer. Having recently visited uh, Glasgow Royal Infirmary and myself and the services, have nothing but praise for the staff there. Absolutely. And I think it's time we started to see more of that instead of degenerating the staff and the workforce there. Can I, though, ask the, the, the Minister, when you mentioned about shortages, and it obviously means mentioned by uh, Anna Sarwar, if the Minister shares my concerns on the, the potential impact of Brexit and basically what effect that will have in recruiting, retaining staff in our NHS. Senator Robertson. Well, of course, we are concerned that Brexit is already damaging recruitment and uh, retention of uh, EU staff. In order to mitigate that, we've uh, committed to looking to pay a settled status fee for any EU citizen working in devolved public services in Scotland. And I think that will help us to keep vital workers in the NHS and, of course, uh, our uh, staff, wherever they come from in the NHS, do a fantastic job. The message is we want to keep people working here wherever they come from. They have a, a huge uh, uh, role to, to play in our NHS and they're most welcome. We want them to stay and we want others to join us. And thank you. Uh, that concludes topical questions.